Chapter 1. Dial-up and the pinings of a former youth pastor. One of the best things about being born in the 80s is that you can confidently say you grew up without the internet. It's a bold statement to be sure, but one validated by having experienced the social media giants from their infancy to present. One made from seeing the online world go from horrible sounding dial-up noises to the combined knowledge of the human race being searchable through a small smartphone uh, in one of your pants pockets. If it truly takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything, like Malcolm Gladwell says, then our millennials, then us millennials, have the biggest shot at being experts at the culture of the internet and technology, if only because we spent the most time with it. I'm one of those millennials, unfortunately. I was one of those kids who rushed home from a classroom that had large, colorful, bubbly iMacs that were all the rage for computer, cl cl computer classes in the middle school. At home, we would quickly get online so that nobody could use the phone on a Tandy 500 that was barely able to connect to the internet. This was way back in the day where we had our favorite search engines. Lycos and Ask Jeeves had a chance against Google. Google wasn't even a verb yet for what we do on the internet. And everyone in high school had a Hotmail account with a ridiculous name attached to it after the at. We spent nights on ICQ and MSN chat rooms talking about what happened that day. In fact, it wasn't until the end of high school that personal internet use looked for us anything like it does for preteens today. The internet may have started a few years prior, but we privileged few offsprings of the 70s and 80s have the opportunity of seeing culture and the world embrace it. The world got simultaneously bigger and smaller, and got more and more as we got more and more connected through our modern marvel of the internet. From the first email sent all the way back in 1971 to the latest trending hashtag on Twitter right now, the world is inexplicably connected and depended on those connections for function these days. They have challenged corporate structures and made millionaires out of frat guys with a great idea for an app or a website. They facilitated real-world political revolutions and in, the and in their absence under controlling dictators stifled the technological growth of entire nations. These connections are powerful and no more greatly seen than in the concept of something going viral. Everything from pictures of cats doing inane things to musical numbers uniquely performed by cover bands, the ability of a creator to post something and have it go viral was and is a ground leveling concept. So where does God fit in here? This book is about theology and the internet, right? The internet of all places is not the first place you think when God comes up. That is unless you're looking for controversy and debate. Because that's what you'll find on nearly every site that hosts these connections equally. God is noticeably absent, or at the very least opposed from the landscape of the web. Sure, there are websites for any number of churches, and every content posting site will have its share of Christians on it, but I can't help but wonder if there are any places where Christians are acting, living, and being Christians online. A Christian, IRL, is a cult culture maker in their community and social context. He or she votes like a Christian, supports or boycotts businesses like a Christian, like the ones that fry chicken, or conversely, the ones who have people taking their clothes off for money. A church does Christian things like what, Bi what the Bible teaches, such as sheltering the homeless, feeding the poor, ministering to those in prison, and seeking social justice for those who cannot for themselves. You would, or at the very least should, notice a Christian if they were indeed living out their faith. It would be hard not to. That's the kind of selfless life modeled after Christ. It would be a thing worth talking about, something truly worth, worthy go of going viral. Yet, for all its efforts, the church seems to flounder online. It can host a good website for a local church, letting you know what is going on in any particular church building. It can do a good job of catering to specific groups of Christians by posting Christian articles for pastors and leaders. But the Christian at large seems dreadfully absent from where the web congregates with non-Christians, separated by the easy-to-erect barriers of do domain names and account information. Sure, Christians are online, but does the world know that they are Christian? Online? Are there places where Christians can interact with others in a way that portrays their religious conviction? And when they can, is it welcome, even appropriate? With some social networks and websites boasting traffic that nearly rivals the population of sovereign nations, the sheer opportunity to connect with people is hard to overlook. These people are sharing their passions and interests and lives, jokingly glued to the personal screens on tablets and phones and laptops. The social aspect of life that some of us come, some of us new in our childhoods prior to the internet exists online in a capacity that frankly can't be ignored. 
Where people used to have meetings face to face, a screen and a Skype call will now suffice. Where kids used to gather in playgrounds to play fantasy games of cops and robbers or tag, even trading cards, now MMOs and online gaming are filling that void in part. There is no denying the scope of the inclusion the internet has on our lives. It would be easy to view the web as just a byproduct of the world these days. But Christians, we have to ask ourselves one pivotal question. Are we in the world, but not of it? Like Jesus prayed for us. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 15 to 17, English Standard Version. That world for most of us millennials, pre-internet kids, the ones that are between 30 and 40 now, with a few kids and have an appreciation for both real life experiences and high speed internet connections, is one of massive transition. Our kids won't know a world without YouTube unless the site shuts down the next year or so, but we will. Our kids won't know a time where not having, Facebook account, not having a Facebook account is weird, but we will. Our retirements will be in a world that does not know at least a half dozen ways to get in touch with your kids, including snail mail and a landline. Pictures of our entire childhoods won't be documented on social media sites. Our recipe books will be the last written down outside of Pinterest. However, you can be damn sure we'll post pictures of our vintage, vintage recipe collections on our Instagram for the next wave of hipsters to come along and find. In all of these transitions, the Christian of the near future will not only be on the internet, but arguably needs to be part of the internet. And the reason I say this is because the church has missed great opportunities before. The biggest one that comes to mind for me is youth ministry. Any church of a decent size and demographic has a youth ministry, but when compared to the amount of youth in their town and city, most show to be ineffective at making new Christians through their efforts compared to the number of possible teen converts in the area. This isn't a criticism of youth ministry as a concept. In fact, most youth, group, most youth groups do great work with the kids that show up. It's a criticism of time and location. Youth age teens are in one place more than any other place during their junior and senior high school years. School. They spend between seven and nine hours a day at school, five days a week for nearly 10 months a year, along with a recommended eight to 10 hours of sleep and family time, youth are nearly exclusively at school the most. However, youth ministry in general is a two to three hour night at the church once a week. That's close to a 45 to one hourly def influence deficit per week. The reason youth ministry works, but isn't effective on a large scale, isn't that the pastors aren't good at their jobs. They are. It's not because the church isn't relevant. It is. It's not because the kids don't need Jesus. They do. It's because we bring a plastic cup to the pool and think our refreshment is full when the cup is, if we only delve in. Insisting that youth go to a building across a town for a tiny fraction of time compared to their weekly routine is asking for the slimmest of margins to work in your favor, a virtual lottery of parenting and faith. Luckily, we have a God who loves to use long shots to show his glory. To show his glory. Kids still get saved at youth group and we see God move in, their lives, in the lives of youth today. But in every effort not to be pessimistic, have you ever done the math on the efficacy of youth ministry? If a small town has a high school of 300 to 400 youth aged kids and 30 of them go to your youth ministry because you're, it's the only one in town, what's your ministry's success rate at introducing young people to Christ? Eight to 10%, assuming every kid that gets to your youth group is the next Billy Graham? You can't run 10% of a race well and expect the rest to run itself for you. You can't eat 10% of a meal and say you're full and leaving 90% of a demographic untouched because of the limits of a job description and the building size is a cop out one that avoids actually addressing the logistical challenges of ministry as a concept. Ministering to the youth of the church would be better done if the youth group or the time spent on youth ministry was bigger, plain and simple, and there's already a larger segment of teens' life where they're taught the values how to interact socially. School. In hindsight, the slew of young men and women who have gone to Bible college in pursuit of youth ministry degrees would have been better served by becoming teachers where they could interact and witness every day with the same group of kids. The salary of an average youth pastor would pay for a four-year teaching degree in less than two years as well. While why we're doing it one, why we're doing one and not the other might be up for debate. But still, imagine that Christians in a place now hostile to, hostile to the gospel, a place where the Bible has been removed or banned, a place where prayer is becoming scarce, and a place where the fu fundamental truth of a youth's born gender is currently being taught as fluid. 
We chose instead to pursue a ministry model in place and through a place where the youth simply aren't, hoping that they would, would show up instead of listening to our Savior's word when he told us to go. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make all dis disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18-20, English Standard Version. And while making disciples, teach them. Teach being the operative word there. The efficacy of church-based youth ministry is the topic of another book. One I'll write later if this book deal goes well. But the same reality faces us every time we open up our web browsers. The age of connection we live in is fertile ground for the gospel to be sown. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly for, to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Luke 10, verse 2, English Standard Version. If we encourage would-be youth pastors in those youth groups to become teachers and principals of the schools, maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't have waded into a pool of possible converts enough to make a noticeable difference in the generation. And I feel that the internet, for as long as it's been around so far, is the big opportunity that the church simply isn't taking seriously as it could. We tiptoe around the edges, testing the waters, but not diving in. Knowing that our Savior walks on waters, more troubled than what we can, can be found online. Our focus looks not our focus looks to be only towards ourselves online and never towards the billions of people that spend hours upon hours online every day. People that congregate in the same place in predictable patterns, people in online communities and websites that are most often devoid of solid Christian presence. People that need to be reached with the life-changing power of Christ's gospel by Christians. What's more is there's a solid chunk of the internet devoted to sin in nearly every form. When we're not absent from the pages of the web, we are definitely opposed to them. The porn industry alone consists, constitutes an estimated 30% of all registered web traffic. That staggering statistic could be doubled when websites that host all types of content, both good and bad, are considered as well. The internet seems plenty full of opposition to God and his will, his people, and his word. And I can't help but ask the question, who's opposing God, who's opposing God on the web, and why? We all know that Satan, yes, first chapter, and we're going deep. We're going off the deep end with talking snakes. Bill, Bill Mayer, opposes God with that, with much, with that much opposition on the internet. And I can't help but wonder what God's plans are for the internet. If the works of Satan are present, then the will of God must be being opposed in some way, right? So what is it? What is the will of God for the internet? A similar situation existed in Christianity's past. There was a very dark time where the only people who had access to the scriptures were some of very corrupt clergy in the church. The average man didn't have a Bible and only got the Bible read to him in, from the official church leadership in Latin and not in his home tongue to boot. Then along came a man named Martin Luther, who along with John Calvin and Johannes Gutenberg, turned a revolutionary technology that was the printing press into a movement that now lets every Christian have access to a Bible of their own in numerous translations in nearly every language commonly spoken, now culminating in one of the most popular apps on every smartphone app market. The Protestant reformers changed the world by making the best of new technology and knowing that tech was just as much a part of God's plan as tradition. How many online Bibles are there now? How many commentaries on the scriptures? How easy is it to link a comment or a tweet to an article that speaks deeper than you ever could about the faith that you hold dear? What if Satan's opposition on the internet is against the God-given ability of the internet to unite the church again? Once and for all, if anything has the power to do it, it's a ubiquitous system and culture that allows for the free and abundant transmission of ideas and information between people, where a Baptist churchgoer can hear a Pentecostal preacher's sermon on their favorite Bible verse via YouTube, where a prayer request can go viral inside a social media platform and not just a long denominational prayer chain's email list. Where the combined knowledge of the Christian faith can be accessed on the go with a decent cellular data plan and a smartphone. We need to engage the people of the world online instead of just carving out a place for Christians to be Christians on the web. Our church websites are great, and our Bible, online Bible study tools are great. Our church apps and prayer chains and Facebook pages are great, but they all point Christians towards the church instead of directing them from the church into an online world on mission. What they don't do is point an unbeliever to the church. 
The internet is desperately missing evangelism. It's missing Christians with a solid apologetic resource and methods to proclaim Christ online. It's missing Christians with the connect connectedness of the web to better serve the body of Christ in accountability and discernment. Because if there's anything that could unify the church, it, it, it is the internet. It's the only place where regardless of denomination or background, a Catholic Jesus lover and a Presbyterian Jesus lover are both equally Christian in regards to themselves and the people they interact with. There are no church walls to separate true worshippers of Christ on the web, no committees or boards or Robert's Rules of Order in elders' meetings. A Christian can be a Christian online because he knows Christ died for his sins and holds virtual hands with, every other, with others in praise of that, with no auspice of traditional denominations that have segregated the church for centuries. Christians can literally be Christians online because they worship God in spirit and truth, bar none. But the hour is coming and is now here where true worshipers will worship in Father and Spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. John 4, 23, English Standard Version. So this book is the prayer Christ instructed us to pray in Luke's Gospel, a prayer that every Christian capable of online interaction might have a theology of the internet, a prayer that the masses of followers and friends that we have and the sheer concept of social media would be a field white for harvest, one spoken so that every church would have the resources to teach its congregation how to spread the gospel online, and more importantly, how it can be hindered. Teaching Christians how to preach the gospel online will look different than teaching them to preach from behind a pulpit, and online realities will change as the traditions have been ingrained for the church today. The messages will be the same, but the medium will be different, like the pages of a German printing press outpacing the handwritten tomes it surpassed. So as you read this ebook on your tablet, Kindle, Kobo, or phone, or you read it the old-fashioned paperback for twice as much money, would you pray with me? Father God, Jesus and Holy Ghost, thank you for the internet. Thank you for all Thank you for the ability to speak and connect with people the world over through it. Thank you for the research and knowledge contained on it. Thank you for the social networks woven into it. Help us know your will for the internet and help us discern your righteous use of it through us. Help us see the value of the wonder of technology and humanity wrapped up in our tablets and computer screens. Keep us from temptation online and help us to remain beacons for your light and not examples of our own failure. Help us see the needy, the broken, and the lost among the usernames and avatars, online as it is in heaven. Amen. So that's chapters one and two of uh, my book, Online as it is in heaven. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this read through is I wanted to uh, engage with the ideas a bit because uh, after the pandemic, I did realize that there's a few things that were written in this book that I really got right and stuff that I really got wrong. And so in this chapter specifically, uh, here are the things that I really want to address and that I'm probably going to change in the second edition of this book. Um, on page uh, 15, it says, In all these transitions, Christians in the near future will not only be on the internet, but arguably needs to be a part of the internet. This is where the first inklings of my idea of the internet being a thing, not a place kind of come from. Um, I've realized over time and after seeing how the church adopted online worship, what the internet actually is. That we've been uh, told and kind of cultured into thinking that it's a place or that it can be a place uh, and that it is a thing. Uh, now, whether it can be a place, I think is up for a deeper philosophical debates, but it is a thing. It's inarguably a thing. It is a, an interconnect, interconnected network of things, of computers, of devices. Uh, it, it, it is more thing than it is place, and this is kind of where it comes from. I'm probably going to change that. There's a few more in here. One sec. Uh, on page 20, uh, the internet is desperately missing evangelism. It's missing Christians with solid apologetic resources and methods to proclaim Christ online. It's missing Christians using the connectedness of the web to serve, better serve the body of Christ in accountability and discernment. I still believe this, but I, uh, I again, it, it, it depends on uh, its an understanding of what the internet can do and can't do and where the church ends and the church's use of the internet begins. So that's another one. I think we have one more here. No, I think that's it. 
Awesome. And then we have the prayer, which is still a great prayer. We might make that just a little bit longer. So uh, that's what I want to focus on these uh, videos on. I want to read the chapter first, so it's here. And I'm still going to make uh, copies of this available um, for people to buy if they want to buy the first version as opposed to the second version. Um, really, there's only been, you know, like a handful of people who have actually bought the book. So I'm not too worried about it, but um, we are going to make it available. And um, yeah, we're going to keep uh, uploading these these sections and we'll kind of go from there. We'll talk to you guys soon.